We can expect a new look fourth line for the Boston Bruins next season with two of the three players who played there most regularly set to become unrestricted free agents. Let's look at the fourth line year in review on today's episode of Locked On Boston Bruins. Your Locked On Bruins, your daily podcast on the Boston Bruins, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, Bruins fans, and welcome back to the Locked On Boston Bruins podcast. I'm your host, Ian McLaren, and this is a daily show where we discuss all things spoke to be. Thank you so much for making Locked On Bruins part of your day every day. We are free and available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today is Tuesday, May 30th, and like I mentioned off the top, we're going to look back at the fourth line and assess how they did, who might be back on that line next season. Before we get into that, a quick reminder, you can find the podcast on Instagram and Twitter at LockedNHLBruins. You can find me, uh, my dad jokes, and hockey tweets at Ian C. McLaren. Now, I'm going to start with Thomas Noshik because he was the fourth line center of note this season. This line, when he was healthy, was built around him. He did, however, only appear in 66 games this season, but he did have a career high in points, seven goals, 11 assists for 18 points, which is a tie for his career high, which he set in 2020-21, but he did it in only 38 games that season, which was one of the reasons why Don Sweeney went out and signed him. Uh, He had a 0.27 point per game rate, good for a 22-point pace over 82 games, second highest of his career. He, of course, was instrumental as well on the penalty kill, a huge player uh, for them with the other team on the man advantage. And he also, yeah, helped in the face-off circle, winning 354 face-offs for a success rate of 59.3, which was the second highest of his career. So very important on the penalty kill, very important in the face-off dot, and you know, pretty much what you would expect or want from your fourth line center. If there were some areas for growth, he could have shot the puck perhaps a bit better. He had a uh, rate of one shot per game, which was down from previous production. But again, he's not really there to provide offense. Um, he's there to lock it down in the face-off circle, kill some penalties, chip in the odd point is nice. And again, he had that career high 18. He also had a career high in penalty minutes, 48, which isn't very helpful when you are called upon to kill penalties. You don't want to be in the box, uh, you know, for 48 minutes of the season when your playing time is limited to begin with. Now, Thomas Noshik is at the end of a two-year contract that he signed with the Boston Ruins that paid him uh, $1.75 million per season over the past two. Will he be back? Well, he said he'd like to be back. His number one priority was to return as a member of the Boston Bruins. Again, a lot of players saying they had unfinished business they want to come back and to make good on this whether or not the Bruins will be able to do that uh, remains to be seen Uh, he said he really likes the group here so we would love to stay hopefully he can make it work stay here it's his number one priority Um, his takeaways from the season he always wanted to focus on positives They've been really great, especially on the PK, which is his job. That's what he's taking away. 
uh, learn from mistakes that happened, be mentally tougher, stronger, so we don't, quote, choke again. Again, whether or not he gets that opportunity remains to be seen. He said, quote, I want to stay here. It's my number one priority. We love Boston. My family love Boston. If there's a chance to sign here, I want to stay here. But it's not up to me right now. And we'll see what's going to happen. I mean, again, we've talked about it so many times. Boston's cap crunch. They have several holes to fill up front. It would be great to have a guy like Thomas Noshik back. Can they afford to pay him 1.75 or maybe a shade less than that, seeing as he's on the other side of 30? It's hard to say. Um, It'd be nice to have him back. It'd be nice to have that continuity on the fourth line, an experienced veteran who knows the job, who uh, accepts the role. But it's very possible that they will have to move on from Thomas Noshik He could be given a better opportunity elsewhere. He's likely going to hit unrestricted free agency. He'll explore his options, maybe circle back and say, this is what I'm being offered. The Bruins likely won't be able to match. And Thomas Noshik will be on his way, unfortunately. Unless he's willing to take a bit less to stay where he has become comfortable. And that likely will be the case for some other key unrestricted free agents as well. And, and, you know, if you're taking a page out of Bergeron and Krejci's book from this past season, all these guys saying they learned from them, they saw um, how much they value playing in Boston. So maybe these guys do the same thing and um, are willing to accept less to stay in Boston and try to get some unfinished business uh, taken care of. Thomas Noshik, though, a pretty good season, all things considered, based on what was expected of him and his role. It'd be nice to see him back to get that continuity, to get some veteran leadership, especially if Bergeron and Krejci don't come back. But it's very possible that another team will come that has more cap space, needs the kind of player that he is, and offers more than the Bruins are able to. Now, Noshik's most common line mates this season were Nick Foligno and A.J. Greer. He also played, of course, with Garnet Hathaway down the stretch. Craig Smith was on the line earlier on in the season. Uh, Jacob Lauko uh, was up there for a time. But we're going to focus... Today on Felino and Greer here coming up after the break. First, a quick word from today's sponsor, our friends over at Athletic Greens. Now, Athletic Greens has a product that thousands of people are raving about online. They have over 7,000 five-star reviews. It's recommended by professional athletes trusted by leading health experts. So what is it? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you can absorb 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. It's a special blend of ingredients that supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, energy, recovery, focus, and aging, all the things. Right now, reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. Just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. Visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL network. They'll give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash NHL network. Take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Thank you so much once again for making Locked On Bruins part of your day every single day. Free and available wherever you get podcasts. And everydayers can expect a look at Connor Clifton and Derek Forbord. I know I said I was going to talk about them today, but pivoted over to the fourth line. And we'll talk about that third pairing uh, on tomorrow's podcast. 
All right, let's talk about Nick Felino and the Felina Sants. Just realized now on my graphic that I did not post yet here on YouTube that I said the Felino Sants would be in segment number one. Here we are talking about it in segment number two. Nick Felino, 35 years old. He's going to turn 36 on Halloween. Our uh, candy corn loving friend birthday on spooky day. You know, a lot of people were looking for a buyout on Nick Felino after his first season in Boston, which was quite unsuccessful, limited to 64 games, two goals, 11 assists for 13 points, which was the lowest since his rookie season back in 2007, 2008, as a member of the Ottawa Senators. Our boy came back with a vengeance this past season. He was limited to only 60 games with an injury suffered in February. That allowed, however, with him and Taylor Hall going on LTIR, it allowed the Bruins to add at the trade deadline. Uh, Nick Foligno chipped in 10 goals. 16 assists for 26 points this season, 0 0.3, 0 0.43 points per game, his highest point per game average since 2019-2020, his uh, final full season as a member of the Columbus Blue Jackets. It was a 36-point pace, which is, yeah, very good for a guy who is in his mid-30s. His shooting percentage was inflated, however, 14.1. He only had 71 shots on goal, uh, the highest shooting percentage since 2016-2017 when he had 26 goals for the Columbus Blue Jackets. His career average is 11.1. .1. So his shooting percentage, higher than his career average, can't really bank on that. Uh, he had 1.2 shots per game, which was down from his career average of 1.8. He chipped in uh, some hits, 147 hits, 7 power play points, 29 blocks. Uh, when he was called upon to take faceoffs, he won 55.6 of them. And again, was uh, a physical presence on the power play for the Boston Bruins. The question is, will he be back in black and gold? If you ask him, he uh, would love to be. He served as kind of a de facto captain down in the uh, bottom six for the Boston Bruins. His leadership was incredibly valuable. He really helped guys like Trent Frederick, he was another sounding board for uh, Jake DeBrusque. And they had like a leader on every line, a guy who is captain material on every line. If you think of Bergeron and Krejci, Charlie Coyle on the third line, and then um, Nick Foligno on the fourth line. After the Bruins lost to the Panthers, he said he thought, one of the most emotional parts for him is not really knowing what's going to happen. It's no secret that he loved it in Boston. He bonded with the guys. They've gone through a lot. I've mentioned many times on the podcast, his speech at the winter classic uh, and how it motivated Jake DeBrusque to step up, score those couple goals. He said he can't control what Sweeney and Cam Neely and the staff decide, but he thinks the feeling's mutual, that they want to try to figure something out. Uh, he would prefer to come back, especially with the way things ended and what he foresees for this group. There's still a lot of great players. Um, there's going to be change because of the cap, but, quote, you hope to be part of it and rectify went, what went wrong this year. Uh, he added he's so committed to this group and... He feels like he's a big part of this team. He can help this team. But at the same time, he said, absolutely, he would play for another team if nothing comes with the Bruins and if there's some interest 
Uh, he says he feels like he has lots to give, especially with the motivation of this year and into the summer. It's only going to burn a fire inside him even more. There's mutual respect between him and Don Sweeney, what he brings, what he can bring. And there's going to be some discussions here in the aftermath of the season with his agent as to uh, whether or not he'll be back. He felt 100%. Um, he was healthy. He, of course, was not in the lineup for Game 7 of the Panthers series. Uh, Nick Felino in the playoffs. You know, it was hard with the Bruins because when they were all healthy, there were some big decisions to be made. And... Montgomery elected to go with Trent Frederick in the lineup over Nick Felino. I'm sure that stung a bit. It was kind of reminiscent of um, David Backus being scratched from the game seven against the St. Louis Blues uh, in the series against the Panthers. He had one goal, two assists for three points. Uh, zero points over the final two games that he played. And he was a minus two, took four penalty minutes in game six. So maybe that was a strike against him. But again, you could maybe say that his leadership and his calming presence would have been better served in the locker room and on the bench than in the press box for game seven. And that's a question that lingers over Jim Montgomery, one of several over the series probably should have had him in there probably should have learned from uh game seven against the blues and not having David Backus. I still think that would have given the Bruins more of an emotional boost. Um, you bring these guys in for their leadership, for their experience. There's no reason to hide it. Um, when the games matter most, no disrespect to Trent Frederick. Um, so yeah, will he be back? Who knows? If he is, it will certainly be less than what he made over the last two years with the Boston Bruins, which was um, $3.8 million cap hit. It'll have to be significantly less than that if he wants to come back. If Bergeron and Krejci aren't back, then again, same as Noshik, you'd love to have his leadership, his experience, that continuity in the bottom six. Uh, but again, another team might come calling and ask or offer him more than what the Bruins are able to in order to keep him. All right, well, let's wrap up by talking about AJ Greer here after the break. Now, one guy we know will be back with the Boston Bruins next season is AJ Greer because he is signed. He has a contract. A very reasonable seven hundred and sixty two thousand dollars and five hundred dollars over next season. Now, AJ Greer, uh, a bit of a revelation for the Boston Bruins. He was signed as a free agent last summer. He was a um, draft pick from 2015, second round pick by the Colorado Avalanche. Wasn't able to find his groove there, nor with the New Jersey Devils over the past two seasons. This year, career high, 61 games played, career high five goals, seven assists for 12 points. Um, he had 114 minutes in penalties, 66 shots on goal, 7.6 shooting percentage, and 101 hits as well. Uh, AJ Greer, he is 26 years old. He'll turn 27 in December, and he will be back as a member of the Boston Bruins here next season because, again, he's under contract. And, you know, Greer was a guy who found himself on the outside looking in in the playoffs. He did not suit up for any game against the Florida Panthers. Uh, you could argue that they could have used his energy. They could have used his willingness to mix it up. Maybe he could have been 
uh, a disruptive presence, gotten under Matthew Kachuk's skin a bit more. But again, when everybody was healthy, he was behind Felino, Frederick, even Jacob Lauco on the depth chart. Uh, now, having said that, Greer probably will have a more regular role with the Boston Bruins next season. This cap crunch, this $4.5 million overage that they are stuck with is going to force them to play some guys on discount contracts, entry-level contracts. It was smart to sign Greer to that two-year deal with a view to this season. They have only $4.93 million in projected cap space at the moment, and that's with seven forwards under NHL contracts for next season, one-way contracts. So they're going to have to promote some guys who could play on the fourth line. Well, do you give John Beecher a shot? He's 22. It depends what your philosophy is for the fourth line. If you want it to be a lockdown line, uh, penalty killing kind of pe people, or you want to have uh, some fresh young legs down there, energy. Beecher signed his entry-level deal for the next two seasons, 9.25, 925,000, not 9.25 million. Um, Oscar Steen could be a candidate to play on the third, fourth line. He's got one year left on his deal. Brett Harrison, Matt Poitra, likely a bit too young to make the jump at this point. Um, and then you have some other guys who are restrictive free agents with arbitration rights like Mark McLaughlin, Shane Bowers, a candidate to play center as well. Don't forget about him. He was acquired from Colorado in exchange for Keith Kincaid. And I mean, he could be a candidate to get some time. He had 14 uh, points. In 37 games with the AHL's Colorado Eagles, seven points in 20 games with Providence Bruins, only one game at the NHL level since being picked uh, 28th overall in 2017. So he could be a dark horse candidate to uh, get some playing time at center next season for the Boston Bruins. The big question is, will they resign Noshik and or Felino? Uh, who will play fourth line center for this team? Who's going to play third line center for this team? There's a lot of potential turnover, especially in the bottom six. Um, and uh, that's going to be a fascinating uh, thing to keep an eye on here uh, over the summer. What, in fact, um, Don Sweeney has up his sleeve. As far as Greer goes, he said it was fun to work with everyone. Definitely a lot of things he'll take home with him. He'll remember the season for the rest of his life. But he's already looking forward to next year, growing personally on the ice as well. And uh, we can expect him to have perhaps even a bigger role for the Boston Bruins next season. All right, that's it for today's episode, my friends. Thank you so much for taking some time to listen to this fourth line recap episode of the Locked on Boston Bruins podcast. We'll be back tomorrow to talk about the uh, third pairing of Connor Clifton and Derek Forbort. Uh, later on this week, we'll look at some of the trade deadline acquisitions and look at the cup final teams as well and talk about how far off the Bruins are being are from being on their level. You could argue that they are above both those teams. And uh, unfortunate that we don't have a Bruins versus Bruce Cassidy Stanley Cup final to look forward to at the moment. I hope you're all doing well, taking care of yourselves, taking care of each other. And we'll talk to you again here tomorrow on Locked On Boston Bruins, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your favorite team every single day.